Stu's a great guy to come alongside of General Boykin, uh, Captain Special Forces, two Bronze Stars in Vietnam, before he resigned his commission to go into the ministry, and brings a lot of those experiences uh, into some of the illustrations in the book, and uh, it's just, uh, I think it'll be a great time, great time for us. All right, Revelation chapter 8, we'll have a word of prayer, and then we'll, we'll jump in. Lord, we just want to come in. Bring our hearts before you, Lord, as we study your word and ask you to, to just speak to us this morning as we, with uh, a great difficulty at time, reading through these horrific judgments that are uh, going to come upon uh, the planet and upon the people here that, are, uh, that don't know you. And Lord, it's uh, heart-wrenching at times, and I, I pray that it would be again this morning, Lord, that you would move our hearts you would give us a burden for the lost. I think certainly that's one of the, uh, the intentions in you revealing the future to us, Lord, that it would change how we view our lives today. And we, we pray that you do that in Jesus' name. Uh, amen. Well, again, uh, timeline, time sequence, we're beginning the trumpet judgments. Now, remember that um, we're in the first half of the, the Great Tribulation, the time of Jacob troubles. A lot of different names the prophets in the Old Testament use, but it's that seven-year period prophesied by Daniel, spoken of by, by Jesus, where a ruler will arise. We used to speculate. Now we know it will be out of the European Union. Uh, he will uh, basically come on the scene and, uh, and be able to bring peace to the Middle Earth. Uh, Middle Earth, especially if you're a hobbit. <laughs> it's, okay. That's why we. That's why we have editing devices. <laughs> won't won't see that one Olelo or hear it on on K Light, but uh, uh, that's a horrific time as well. We probably should show a, a film clip of one of those battles to get a sense of what the tribulation is going to be like when you when you think about it. Uh, it's not. Uh, now we get a little insight to J.R. Tolkien, <laughs> where he got some of those battle scenes there. Uh, actually, that's coming up in next week's message in, uh, in chapter 9, uh, one of the battles of Middle Earth. So you'll have to come back for that one. But, uh, uh, but here we go in the middle of the uh, tribulation period. We used to speculate about these things and how they would come about. We, we actually live in these days now. This leader will basically be able to uh, bring about what's referred to as the Clintonian plan, uh, and that is the plan that uh, our former president put on the table as an incentive to try to bring peace to the Middle East uh, between Hamas, the Palestinians, uh, and Israel, uh, and their other uh, Islamic neighbors, many of them that want to live at peace with them, countries like Jordan, Morocco, and other uh, Islamic countries that are moderate, as well as the, uh, the radicals that want to destroy them. This man will be able to bring peace by instituting the Clintonian plan, which allows the Jews to rebuild the temple on the Temple Mount next to the uh, Dome of the Rock and the Alaska uh, Mosque that is uh, there on that temple uh, area in Jerusalem. So we used to again used to uh, speculate how these things might come about. We actually live in the day when these things are discussed on a, on a regular basis. I just saw one poll, and it, it asks uh, people, how many, how many people are concerned about the uh, Ezekiel 37 and 38? And about 70% of the people in this country said they were. Of course, the actual question was uh, Iran being, uh, having nuclear weapons. But, you know, it's the same thing. People are very concerned about the fulfillment of Bible prophecy. Even if they don't know the prophecies, they know the potential dangers that are, that are coming. So very interesting days that we live in. But uh, we're in this time where Jesus has been the one found worthy to open the seals of this scroll and begin to read and begin to unleash this, this judgment. So there were six seal judgments. The seventh one has been opened. That unleashes the trumpet judgments that we're going to see, see this morning. There's been a time of, uh, of tremendous worship in heaven that we saw last week uh, because what is going on simultaneously, John gives us these uh, parenthetical or parentheses in what's going on on earth and allows us to see what's uh, going on in heaven. 
in what's going on during these judgments on earth. You have 144,000 Jewish uh, people that have come to faith in Yeshua or Jesus, and they are uh, divinely protected by, by God against the Antichrist who wants to kill them against these uh, supernatural disasters that are being poured out. And they are going around the world preaching the gospel, telling other people uh, about how they can be saved from their sins. And um, as they do that, it's effective, and there's a worldwide revival. Uh, but of course, when people come to faith in Christ during this time period, they are martyred for their faith. And then last week we saw them, the tribulation martyrs, around the throne of God and tremendous worship uh, going on uh, as they are there. And that's uh, the context as we get to chapter 8. Let's take a look at the first six uh, verses. We see a silence and a special angel that precede uh, these judgments. Verse 1, when he opened the seventh seal, that's Jesus, there was silence in heaven for about a half an hour, and I saw seven angels who stand before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. Then another angel, having a golden censer, came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints. Upon the golden altar, which was before the throne, and the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints, ascended before God from the angel's hand. Then the angel took the censer and filled it with fire from the altar and threw it to the earth. And there were noises, thunderings, lightnings, and an earthquake. So the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. So silence in heaven, and again, this is silence in heaven in contrast to the tremendous uh, worship that's uh, going on uh, at the fact that the tribulation saints are, are gathered around the throne of God. And we know now that every time a person, a man, woman, or a child comes to faith in Jesus Christ, the angels in heaven are throwing a party, right? They're having a luau or something up there. They have a, they're rejoicing around the throne of God. Well, that scene that we just looked at, it's, it's uh, built around the worship uh, and glory that is being ascribed to God uh, because of the salvation of the tribulation martyr. So it's and then all of a sudden, Jesus begins to open this next seal, which is going to unleash the seven trumpet judgments. And when Jesus begins to do that, it's, there's, it's just dead silence in contrast to this tremendous worship that's been, been going on. Of course, John says for about a half an hour. He's not up there. He doesn't have a heavenly watch. <laughs> They're outside the time-space continuum. He's just trying to give us a sense of it was like a really long time. Nobody said anything. Nobody moved. You could literally hear a, a pin drop. And it was because there was something uh, of enormous importance that was about ready to happen. And that's the idea of this, uh, this silence in heaven. And uh, we certainly could say that the silence was the lull before the, uh, the storm. Because the judgments, uh, and again, keep in mind, a quarter of the population of the earth has already been killed. Uh, there's already been some very, very heavy things that have happened in these sealed judgments, but now, now things are going to get more intense than that. Uh, the prophets of the Old Testament spoke about this time. Uh, Zephaniah 1.7 says, Hold thy peace at the presence of the Lord God, for the day of the Lord is at hand. Uh, and then in verse 16 he says, A day of the trumpet. So again, the Old Testament prophets prophesied actually these scenes uh, in the book of Revelation. Remember, John is, is quoting the Old Testament some 400 times, so that's why it's so important that we're constantly going back if we're going to understand the future uh, that John's revealing for us. Uh, Ze uh, Zechariah 2.13 says, Be silent, o, o, o all flesh, before the Lord, for he is raised up out of his holy habitation. And then later in that chapter, he says, The Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. So there's uh, silence in contrast to the great worship and the sound of the worship. And again, we, uh, during the uh, last outreach, we had a Calvary Como Mai, and not everybody was uh, appreciative of the, uh, <laughs> the worship band that was there because of its volume. But uh, again, uh, don't be too discouraged, but it's going to be even louder in heaven, apparently around the throne of God. But in contrast, now there's tremendous silence uh, because Jesus is uh, opening this seventh seal. Now, uh, it's followed by the trumpets being given to these angels, and we've been introduced to them already all the way back in chapter 1. They've been mentioned uh, a few times. 
And, uh, and they are there before the throne of God, obviously being given, waiting to be given a special commission. They are there to do the bidding of God. We've already seen a raking and an order of these uh, angelic beings. Uh, we made references from Isaiah's uh, uh, vision there in uh, chapter 6, and we looked at that on Wednesday nights, talking about a type of age, angel referred to as a seraph, and the plural of seraphim, the flaming one. So even the names chosen describing them is uh, uh, just an awesome experience. As John now is seeing this, these seven angels are given the seven trumpets, and John uh, understands from a Jewish perspective what, what this means. Trumpets played are very important part in the Old Testament because they were really into jazz. I'm just seeing if you're all staying here with me. Okay, everybody looked up, so that means you're not asleep. If no head came up, that means you're resting comfortably at this point. But uh, very Jewish context here. Again, according to Numbers 10, the trumpets were used to call people together. They announced times of war. They announced special times and special feast days. Trumpets were sounded. On Mount Sinai, as the law was given, they were blown when kings were anointed and put on thrones. Two silver trumpets were used to assemble the children of Israel as they were going to move about in their wilderness wandering. It's how God orchestrated, guided, and directed and announced special things in the Old Testament. And you're familiar with those trumpets that played at a little city called Jericho as uh, Joshua struck up the band and we saw God move in, in that city as well. So, John, in his very Jewish context, and I, sees these seven trumpets given to these seven angels. He knows God is about ready to, to direct and orchestrate what could be a gathering, but there's a sense of this silence that there's a dread that goes with it. So he pretty much knows God is going to announce a time of war, and it's a time of war against planet Earth. And then we're introduced to another angel with a special commission, and he has a golden, a golden censer. And uh, his activities are described. Now, again, we've pointed out the fact that it's uh, important to understand the tabernacle and it's set up there in the book of Exodus because when God tells Moses to build it, he doesn't say, make this kind of like this. <laughs> he says, make this exactly like this because this is a pattern of what is in heaven. And, uh, and so because of that, this angel, this special angel with the golden censer, we have a sense of what he's doing because he's replicating, in a sense, what the priest would do every morning in that tabernacle later in the temple. Later in the temple, Zacharias, you remember the father of John the Baptist prior to his birth, he's going to, as a Levite, he's going to go into the temple. He's, again, they serve in courses, and he's there uh, a couple of weeks out of the year, and maybe once in your lifetime as a Levite, you would be drawn by lot, get the privilege of be the one to actually burn incense before the, the golden altar. Zacharias, his name is drawn, and you know the story, he gets to go in. But again, what is he doing? What's the angel doing in heaven? Well, basically, he has like a golden bowl that's held on chains. I don't know if you ever saw the photographs of this. They're really old, but still pretty good. And, uh, and it holds the coals from the altar where the sacrifices uh, are being made out in that, uh, again, more of the temple proper area. He's got a special incense that uh, is used only for this person purpose was forbidden by any Jew to use this incense for any other reason in their home or anywhere else. It was unique to the, what was going on in the temple. And then, you know, John, like this angel, then goes in. Now, John, he goes into the, he's a Levite, but he's not the high priest, so he can't go into the Holy of Holies where the Ark of the Covenant is, but he can go into the holy place. And on the right, he would see the table of showbread, one loaf, sourdough, I'm sure, there, no, not really, <laughs> lined up to representing the 12 tribes of Israel. But again, Jesus would say he's the fulfillment of that. He is the bread of life. On his left would be the menorah and uh, the golden candlesticks. Again, lighting that area, even Jesus would come in John's gospel. He is the light of the world. And now the, the, uh, the golden altar right there, again, replicating or giving us a little picture of what is taking place in heaven and you know, with John, he would take the, excuse me, with Zechariah, he would take the uh, incense, lay it on those coals, and of course, as soon as it hits the hot coals, you know, the, the cloud would fill that area, representing the prayers of the saints. So that happened every morning. 
The priests are on their duty. They're out there interceding. They're worshiping God. They're praying. People all over the nation are praying uh, on a regular basis. And every morning, there, it was symbolically represented by this incense that would fill the temple back, back in the tabernacle days. It would just float uh, into the heavenlies, a picture of our prayers going up before God. Now, this is very different, this scene in heaven. So we have a sense of what's going on in heaven that John is describing because of the tabernacle because of what we know about it. But at the same time, something very different happens here. <clears throat> when he, it says it's with much incense, and then he takes no, an, uh, another portion of fire and puts it in there, and obviously by the command of God, he then turns and dumps it towards planet Earth. And then there's noise, there's lightning, there's thunder, which is accompanying uh, the orders of God is he's been giving them to these angels throughout the book, which means what's happening here uh, is happening with the full authority and the full power of, of, of a sovereign God uh, behind them. So again, uh, what actually is, is happening here is God is answering our prayers. Now, remember, for century, we Christians have been praying, thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth, even as it is in heaven. And God's about ready here to answer those prayers. It's kind of interesting as we get into the judgments that our prayers are being answered and our prayers are, are intrinsically tied to God's wrath being poured out here. And we've actually, you know, I think sometimes we don't relate to this so much in the Western world because though we are now facing persecution to some degree, and we hear about it all the time, and certainly it happens throughout the media, what happens through lawsuits and discrimination and so forth. Uh, but as the writer of Hebrews has said, you have not yet resisted to the shedding of your blood, but they certainly have in, in many parts of the rest of the world. And in those places and in those times, people have been praying for God's kingdom to come and his will to be done. And what they mean by that may be something very different from us. Here, we might be praying for God's kingdom to come, you know, because I'm sure everybody lives a very comfortable life in heaven, and I would like to live a very comfortable life here. I'm sure everybody in heaven has uh, anything they want to eat anytime they want it, and I certainly want that here in my home as well. Uh, but in the rest of the world, when they're praying that, they're praying for deliverance because they're being persecuted. They're praying for God's will to be done in people's lives, that men and women and children would open their hearts and their minds to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And now the answer to those prayers has come, but many have rejected. There's a worldwide revival going on. Hundreds of thousands of people are coming to faith in Jesus Christ, but there's great persecution. And now God's judgment in answer to our prayers, the church, through the centuries, is about ready to be poured out on, on planet Earth. Again, we've often said that the purpose of prayer is, is not to get man's will done on earth, but to get God's will done on, on earth. Look back at chapter 6 and verse 9. Remember the, the martyrs of the church history. Uh, uh, the church age there are crying out, asking God to answer their prayers. It says, when he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, and to you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth. Martyrs, men, women, and children from the church age, people that live in our day and age, people that are uh, dying for their faith in China, in Muslim countries, uh, in Indonesia, different places around the world today. They have a special place in the heart of God and a special place around the throne of God. And they're saying, how long, O Lord? And he says now, in answer to those prayers and all of those prayers, that golden censer and those prayers are going to be answered as it is now cast back towards, uh, towards heaven. So uh, very, very interesting, very different than, than just this idea of we pray and our prayers rise to the throne of God. It is supposed to show us there is a reality, there is a definite tie. When you and I pray, God hears us. Our prayers go to God's throne, and he is there, and he is the sovereign uh, king of the entire universe, uh, of everything. And he, as we'll uh, see later, will move heaven and earth in answer to our prayers. It's such a powerful thing that God 
allows us to enter into because of, again, because he has shed his blood to forgive us of our sins, to end the separation and the gap that was there before, that we might have a, a, a personal relationship with him. So there's silence. There's a special angel that precede these judgments. Let's go ahead and look at the judgments. Second point is there will be sudden ecological disasters that are results of the judgments, and that's in verse 7 to 13. The first angel sounded, and hail and fire followed mingled with blood. And they were thrown to the earth, and a third of the trees were burned up, and all green grass was burned up. Then the second angel sounded, and something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea, and a third of the sea became blood, and a third of the living creatures in the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. Then the third angel sounded, and a great star fell from heaven, burning like a torch, and it fell on a third of the rivers and on the springs of uh, water. The name of the star is Wormwood. A third of the waters became wormwood, and many men died from the water because it was made bitter. Then the fourth angel sounded, and a third of the sun was struck, a third of the moon, and a third of the stars, so that a third of them were darkened. A third of the day did not shine, and likewise the night. And I looked, and I heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth, because of the remaining blasts of the trumpets of the three angels who are about to sound. So, again, these first four judgments are basically ecological disasters. As we'll look at next week, uh, the next two trumpet judgments have to do with demonic entities that are going to bring about horrific conditions uh, on, on the planet as well. Let's look at these four. First sudden disaster destroys vegetation. The first trumpet destroys a third of the trees and, and all of the, uh, all of the, the grass. It's, uh, uh, again, symbolic language, hail and fire mingled with blood, reminds us of the seventh plague in Egypt. And, uh, and again, sometimes we, uh, I think we can, we can grow up reading or maybe understanding a little bit of the Old Testament uh, and we see that the judgment of, uh, of God uh, there in the Old Testament, you know, physically being delivered several times uh, to people groups and places and, and so forth. And we can have a tendency to think, yeah, there's a God of the Old Testament, there's a God of the New Testament. And I like the God of the New Testament because that's kind of a hippie guy, Jesus, and he's walking around feeding everybody, you know, healing everybody. He was very kind, very loving. Even children could sit on his lap and so forth. I just don't like the God of the Old Testament because that, that's got to be a real mean guy with a long gray beard and a big stick in his hand, and he, he whacks everybody that gets out of line and so forth. But uh, again, this dispels all of that. People were saved in the Old Testament by God's grace. And they were often judged because of God's holiness, his righteousness, and his integrity. In the New Testament, people are saved by God's grace. And then they are often judged and will be judged because of his holiness, his righteousness, and his integrity. And it's, um, uh, I, I don't suppose there's a lot of pleasure in coming here every week and listen to me expound upon God's, uh, God's judgment. And uh, uh, there's not a lot of pleasure in, in delivering it uh, either, but it certainly is part of the equation. Uh, God is a righteous God. Uh, he will not be mocked. Is he mocked a lot today? It's incredible, the things that people say, the things that are said in the media, the things that people say against God and against God's name as though there is no repercussions. Nothing will ever happen as a result of it. We live in very interesting days. None of us would, will take pleasure in any of these things that will take, uh, uh, happen here on, on planet Earth, and yet uh, it will just be a horrific time. In Egypt, God poured out his judgment and freed the people and saved them from it. Uh, and uh, certainly this is a tremendous time of judgment, as you could imagine what will happen when planet Earth looks like a desert. All the green grass is gone. I think that will interrupt the food supply just, just a little bit. The second uh, sun disaster destroys the sea, again, reminding us of the first plague in Egypt, turning the Nile into Nile waters into blood. The word sea is, uh, is singular, uh, and it's preceded by a pronoun, the sea. So it's not the seas of the earth, but it is the Mediterranean. And God's prophetic view of Israel, that's the sea that is in, in view. But uh, uh, again, 
there's not a literal mountain. It's symbolic language. It's like a mountain, whatever it would be, whether God would use a meteor or a nuclear blast or whatever it might be. Everything in the Mediterranean is pretty much uh, uh, wiped out. Again, these things were prophesied in the Old Testament as well. Hosea 4.3, therefore the land will mourn. Everyone who dwells there will waste away with the beast of the field and the birds of the air. Even the fish of the sea will be taken away. Uh, Zephaniah 1.2, I will utterly consume everything from the face of the land, says the Lord. I will consume man and beast. I will consume the birds of the heavens, the fish of the sea, and the stumbling blocks along with the wicked. I will cut off man from the face uh, of the lamb. So ships will be destroyed, a third of them. And I just went through and looked up a little bit of the uh, ongoings uh, in terms of what this would mean in in the Mediterranean. There's about 220,000 vessels uh, carrying uh, more than 100 tons that cross the Mediterranean uh, every year, uh, many with hazardous cargo. It's estimated that every year between 100 and 150,000 tons of crude oil go through the, uh, the Mediterranean. And uh, there is around 250 to 300 oil tankers that are in the Mediterranean on any given day throughout the, the year. You can imagine when a third of them go under and are sunk. Most of the Soviet Navy, former Soviet, most of the Russian Navy actually is in the Mediterranean at at any one given time, which means we got a few boats over there ourselves as well. It's It's a very busy place, and when this happens, a third of everything in the water basically is is wiped out. The third thing is the the sudden disasters destroy the water supply. God's wrath reaches inland, making fresh water taste bitter using the, uh, again, this idea of wormwood, something John would have been very familiar with. But uh, uh, again, the Bible tells us that God has named all of, the, all of the stars. And he uses a star that he calls wormwood and cast it down. Apparently, I mean, God can do it anyway, but apparently it breaks up because a single star crashing into the planet would kind of... Uh, the final curtain would fall very quickly after that, but apparently it breaks up and hits all of the uh, fresh water streams uh, and begins to make them undrinkable. That's what the word wormwood means. It means bitter. Jeremiah the prophet used the term. Amos uh, used it. Moses warned that idolatry would bring sorrow to Israel like a root producing wormwood. So they're very familiar with the the terminology here. Anybody that drinks these waters, obviously uh, it's going to cause death. Uh, and then the fourth sun disaster destroys a portion of the solar system. The uh, first three trumpets affect a portion of the planet. Obviously, this would affect everybody uh, on, on the planet. I don't think God is going to, and I, it seems to be a temporary thing for a period of time because later in the book, we're going to read about that God uses the sun and increases its intensity as actually part of the, uh, the judgment uh, as well. And this judgment parallels the ninth plague in Egypt, which there, again, wasn't permanent, but lasted three, three days. In that passage in Exodus 10, 21, it says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand towards heaven, that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt. Darkness which may be even felt. Have you ever been someplace so dark that you could feel it? So Moses stretched out his hand towards the heaven, and there was thick darkness in all the land of Egypt three days. They did not see one another, nor did anyone rise from his place for three days. But all the children of Israel had light in their, their dwelling. So God will affect the solar system, uh, the stars, the moon, uh, and so forth, and the sun, so that uh, there is a, a portion of darkness that will bring, uh, I think, a great terror uh, over, over the land and over the people. I was, uh, I was thinking about this, and uh, a number of years ago, the first hurricane that, that hit Hawaii, at least for my memory, was uh, Hurricane Eva, which I think uh, Melissa was like three months old at the, uh, at the time. We, we remember it well because a, a branch broke out of our mango tree that was about uh, that thick, and it, it fell right next to our bedroom, about 18 inches away from the roof of our house where the three of us were uh, sleeping at the, uh, at the time. Earlier in that day, I was still working, and I was uh, still building windows, uh, stained glass windows at the time, and I was in a, a really uh, beautiful condo that was being done in Waikiki, and 
I was with the, the guy that uh, was my Finnish guy, and we're installing this big Koa light box and trying to get the, uh, the window in. And guys are hanging wallpaper, and the whole building is shaking, you know, because the, the hurricane is coming. The sliding glass doors are rattling and stuff. But uh, uh, we were working for um, Mark Matsuoka at the time, who was a brilliant uh, interior designer, and he had this thing about deadlines, hurricane or not. So we were all up there working away and until... You know, all the power went out and went, okay, I guess we're going home now. And uh, so all the power was gone. And uh, we packed it all up, boxes and buckets, and, and then realized, okay, uh, no elevator. Oh, no problem. We'll just take the stairs. We walked into that staircase. Uh, Hank and I, and the door shut behind us. And it's like, oh, oh, yeah, let's just stop right here for a moment. I open the door again. You, you could not see your hand in front of your face. We're on about the 12th floor or something like that. And it's like, Okay, let's kind of think this through. It's not that I mind walking down in the pitch dark, but uh, is there another way, an outside staircase? And we kind of looked around, nothing. So, okay, here we go, 12 flights of stairs. And I'm glad he was thinking. He says, okay, we got to kind of count the stairs and make sure we hit the landings and we know what floor we're on. We don't want to, worst case scenario, we come out into the basement and the door locks behind us. Bad, bad place to be in the middle of a hurricane. Uh, when the power's out. So we, we did that. But it was creepy. I mean, you, talk, you could feel the darkness. Man, if somebody would have hit in that stairway and just even said, boo, you know, we'd have just lost it. <laughs> it's just, you're, you're just like waiting for something like that to, to happen. It's terrifying. And on top of all these other things that have happened in portions of the planet, now everybody is experiencing uh, there's something incredible and supernatural about these uh, events. Now, keep in mind, well, this is going on. We've got 144,000 Jewish uh, believers who put their faith in Yeshua HaMashiach, and they are out there with all they got preaching the gospel, men and women and children from every nation, tribe, people, and tongue. They're able, gifted by God, to speak in every language and every dialect, and there are hundreds of thousands of people coming to faith in Christ during this time period. It's getting, that's going on, but these horrific judgments are going on. The Antichrist is, is uh, sending his armies out. They're persecuting any believers. They're persecuting the Jews. Two-thirds of the Jews around the world will be, will be slaughtered during this time. We talk about all Israel being saved in the end. It's about a third <laughs> that God supernaturally protects. So it's just a, a horrific time on planet Earth. Jesus uh, talked about it in Matthew 24 and Luke 21. There would be signs in the sun, in the moon, uh, and in the stars. Uh, the last thing, the sudden judgments are followed by a warning. So at this point, there's a remarkable messenger that appears in the sky uh, and, uh, and has a, uh, a very desperate message. And, and a couple things. There's uh, some, if you've got a King James, New King James, it says angel. If you've got a NIV or another translation, it's going to say eagle uh, in, in the sky. Uh, you know, God can get the message out there any way he wants. There's some manuscript discrepancy. A few have uh, this idea of eagles, but uh, I think the uh, King James guys went with the idea of angels because that, that fits everything else. God is using angels uh, for particular activities during this time. No reason not to believe that uh, this is not an angel, but uh, understand what the, uh, the angel is doing. We say the word woe, and we kind of get to that. That's probably not good news, right? Is any, uh, you know, woe unto you. Nobody's going, hey, well, thank you very much there. But uh, it, it, that still doesn't uh, convey what it's, what it's saying in this Greek term. It's, it's basically, it's, uh, the, you know, it, it should, the angel is saying, you should be scared to death. It's, it's a scream. It's, you know, hey, Middle Earth, does that sound like something? <laughs> it's those kind of things. You know, that, that you, it's scaring them to death. It's this angel is going around the earth saying, you should be scared to death because of what's about ready to happen. So in other words, things are going to intensify. And as you'll see next week, they're going to get worse. But the phrase, it's to the inhabitants of the earth or those that dwell on the earth. It's found 12 times in Revelation. Uh, and what it's talking about, it, it is the opposite of those whose citizenship is in heaven. So it's talking about those that have taken the mark of the beast that are part of the Antichrist and his kingdom. His kingdom is falling. It's coming down. And God is warning them, it's getting worse for you. 
Men and women, children are being saved out of this world during, during this cataclysmic time. But the people that remain, those who have put their hearts and minds and set their sights on the things of this world and this world alone, and that's what they've lived for instead of the kingdom of God, it's horrific what's about ready to come upon you, basically is what this angel uh, is saying. Now, John has already described that type of person back in his uh, epistle in 1 John 2.15, uh, talking about the fact there's a warning to us. And we need to be careful that friendship with the world is in the world's value, which he's already said is anti-Christ. It's against Christ. Is not, a, uh, is not a good thing. And, of course, he's not talking about people, but he's talking about a world system that exists uh, that is against the Lord and against his, his kingdom. So, again, the... It's just a horrific thing, and these, these judgments are going to get worse. And um, uh, you'll be glad to know that if there's another uh, parenthetical portion or a parenthesis uh, after we look at those next two trumpet judgments. We're now, like we did after the sealed judgments, we get, okay, we get a little view of heaven. We find out a few more details of what's going on. We're introduced to two witnesses that play an important role 